We discuss in this lesson algorithms to compute the spatial extent of a set of points. Put simply, if we have a set of points like those on the screen, we want to define the region that would best characterize or would best abstract these points. In this case, one solution would be the polygon in orange that we see here. In the context of terrain modeling, this is a useful operation if we want to, for example, calculate the area covered by, the, by a data set, if we want to convert it to another format, for example, to rasterize a data set, or if we just want to get an overview of which area several data sets would cover. It's way faster to load a few polygons than to load billions of points. Finding the polygon that best approximates the set of points is not always simple. Consider this aerial data set of, the of a part of a city of Delft in the Netherlands. What is uh, the spatial extent of that data set? Is this just a rectangle or is it something more complex? Notice that there are many canals in that data set and in these canals there are almost no points. So a better polygon that would approximate that area would be something like in red, which doesn't contain all the uh, canals. And notice also that one small canal is isolated from the other and would actually form an interior boundary in the polygons. The same operation can be useful for a point cloud of a facade of a building, for example, if we wanted to omit all the windows. There again, the polygon would be not simple. It would just, its outer boundary would simply be a, a rectangle or a square, but there would be several interior boundaries to represent all the windows. We consider only the two-dimensional case in this lesson. So for point clouds, we need to first project all the points either to the 2D plane in the case of aerial data sets or to a vertical plane for facades. The first thing to notice is that the spatial extent is a vague concept and that for a given set of points, there are several good answers. You can see here that for the same very simple data set, if we use three different strategies, we will obtain very different polygons. And all of these polygons could be drawn by a human that would think, yes, that represents uh, the region for the set of points. We will see in the following four different algorithms to create spatial extents of a set of points. To evaluate these different algorithms, we can have a look at four different properties that they might have. The first one is, is the polygon that is output or the polygons that are output, are they regular or not? That is, do they self-intersect and do they contain dangling pieces? All the polygons in these figures are regular, except the second one that has a dangling piece. The second property is, are all the points contained inside the region that we're creating? For the four polygons here, A and B contains the, all the points, but notice that C and D are omitting one point, which can be considered as an outlier. The third property is, do we create one connected component or many? In the cases of A, B, and C, we have only one connected component, which is only one polygon, but in the case of the D, we have two connected components. And the fourth property is, are polygons allowed to have interior boundaries or holes? Only one of the polygon in the, in the region D has a hole. The first method we present is the convex hull which is the minimal convex set that contains all the points in the set. For a given set of points, this convex hull is uniquely defined and does not require any user-defined parameters, unlike all the other methods that we will see in a second. The strength of the convex hull is that it creates one polygon that is ensured to be non-degenerate, which means that it's going to be regular, and this polygon will contain all the points and will for sure not contain any holes. Constructing a convex hull can be done by first constructing a Delaunay triangulation, as we've seen in another lesson. But it can also be done by using the gift wrapping algorithm. The gift wrapping algorithm starts with a point that is guaranteed to be on the convex hull. In this case, uh, we pick the point which is in green here, which is an extreme of the data set. 
because we know that it's guaranteed to be on the convex hull. So an extreme can be, in this case, it's the point that has the lowest y coordinates. Then the algorithm starts by calculating uh, the polar angle between the horizontal line that you can see here and all the other points in the set. And we pick the point for which the polar angle is the smallest one. So in this case, it would be the one which is on the left of the data set. Then we know that the first uh, straight line segment of our convex hull is that line. Then we repeat the same operation, but instead of using the horizontal line, we use the line that we just inserted. So then like we check for all the other points, which one has the smallest polar angle with respect to the line that we just defined. Then we pick another one. So as you see, we're simply wrapping around the data set and the algorithm will continue like this at every step and it will stop when it's visited the point from which it started. The second method is called the moving arm, and it's a generalization of the gift wrapping algorithm to create the convex hull that we've just seen. The main and only modification is that uh, at each step, instead of having an infinite line that is used to calculate the polar angles, uh, this line is replaced by an arm of a given length, for example, 10 meters. This means that at each step of the algorithm, we don't consider all the other points in the set, but only the ones that are within 10 meters or within a given the length of the arm of the points. That means that if we start at a given point, for example, the same one as we did before, as you can see now, the second point that we pick is not the one that is completely on the left of the data set, as it was the case for the convex hull, but another one that is closer to it. And then if, we, if you can see here every step of the algorithm, and you can see that it, le uh, that it yields uh, something that is rather different from the convex hull. The properties of the moving arm are very different from the ones of uh, the convex hull. The first one is that one regular polygon is created, although as it can be read in the book, uh, there are degenerate cases, and it's possible that uh, bad or self-intersecting polygons are created. Uh, not all the points are considered, so some points are ignored because they're too far away from the other ones. Uh, and one component is created, and also uh, and this component can be non-convex, uh, and there are also no holes in the polygon that is being created. The third method is called the chi shape, and it's based on first constructing the Delaunay triangulation of the set of points, as you can see here. The chi shape considers the spatial extent to be the exterior envelope of that triangulation. So at first, this envelope will be the convex hull of the set of points. But then what the chi shape does is that it will remove iteratively the longest edge which is on that envelope. So as you can see here, we're removing the longest edge and then we're updating this, uh, we're updating the triangulation and we're also updating the exterior envelope. And we continue doing so to removing the longest edge until uh, all edges are shorter than a, a given uh, threshold. But the, also we need to be careful that we don't create polygons that are uh, not regular. So for example, let's self-intersect. So as you can see here, uh, there are longer edges that cannot be removed because if we remove them, then we would create a self-intersection in the polygon. So these polygon, so these edges are not allowed to be removed. So the algorithm is very simple and it yields a uh, nice property. So these properties are that the polygon is guaranteed to be regular because we imply, because we have constraint, we make sure that it's not uh, self-intersecting. All points will be part of the region. There's only one component that's created and there's also no holes in the region. The fourth and last method that we see is called the alpha shape, which is conceptually a generalization of the convex hull of a set of points. The alpha shape is best understood with the styrofoam analogy. That is, let's assume that we have points in the plane, then we fill the whole plane with a soft material like styrofoam, like you can see here, so blue is the styrofoam. And then we imagine that all the points are made of very hard material, for example, rock. Now imagine that we have a carving tool uh, and this carving tool is allowed to remove styrofoam from any direction, from anywhere. 
In the case of the alpha shape, this carving tool is a circle of a given radius, as you can see here, and the radius of this circle is the alpha uh, parameter in the alpha shape. So we could say, for example, that the radius of a given circle would be 10. And then what we do is that with this carving tool, we remove um, styrofoam and we can only be blocked by the points because they are very hard material. So you can see here that we're removing in every direction all the styrofoam that we can. And we're not bounded to start from the exterior, we can go anywhere. So also, we can also uh, create a hole in the shape. And uh, as you can see here with that shape, we have one shape which is, which represents, for example, the letter B. And we have the uh, hole or an interior boundary for that B. Uh, when we're finished, what we obtain in blue is called the Q-hole. It's called the Q-hole because, as you can notice, the edges between any two points are not necessarily straight line edges, but circular arcs. So if between any two, if we replace the circular arcs by uh, straight line edges, for example, here in orange, so we go from circular to straight line, then we obtain what is called the alpha shape. We can see here for the same set of points, uh, five different alpha shapes that were created with different alpha parameters. So if we go from left to right, the alpha parameter is uh, decreasing in value. So on the left, we imagine that we have a very, very large alpha parameter, something that could be infinite, for example. So in that case, the um, carving tool will not be allowed to go inside the data set will not be able to carve the styrofoam inside the data set and therefore what we will obtain for a very large value of alpha is the convex hull. Then if we go to B, then we have a smaller values for the parameter alpha and then there are the shape that we create is not convex but is concave as you can see here. And then if we continue, you can see different properties of the alpha shape. One of them is that we don't necessarily create one polygon, we simply create uh, what is called simplices. So the alpha shape is formed by a set of triangles, edges and points. And it's possible that you have degenerate cases like the one here in C. Um, in D, you can see that the alpha shape has the nice properties of being able to have holes inside the region that it's created, unlike all the other methods that we've seen so far, and that can be very useful in practice. For example, if you remember the aerial LiDAR that we have at the beginning of the video, or the windows, then these have holes if we want to represent them, so that's very useful to use an algorithm that allows us to uh, represent holes in the region. Bum 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 bum